Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session. My name is AJ Kuftik, and I'm Principal Technologist with Expedient. I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we're going to talk about crossing the cloud chasm. Um, first, real quick, uh, quick housekeeping note. Uh, please enter all questions into the chat panel. Normally, I say enter them into the Q&A panel, but we're going to enter those into the chat panel today. Uh, we'll answer them live. Uh, Brian Smith, uh, who's our Chief Strategy Officer, and Johnny Ernest, who's one of our Technical Account Managers, will be answering questions live in the chat. Um, if you uh, ask a question, you enter a winner prize. That prize is a Bose SoundLink. Uh, we'll also be doing a live Q&A at the end, so if you get to the end and have a question, we'll still answer questions at the end. Uh, and all of this is being recorded, uh, so if you have to step away or you want to show this to someone else, uh, you'll get a link to the recording of this. Um, the, uh, this will be on our webpage at go.expedient.com slash webinar replays. This will be on our YouTube page at uh, youtube.com slash expedient. And it will be on our Instagram at underscore expedient. For those of you who are new to Expedient, we were founded in 2001. We started as a co-location company, moved into managed services, and are now in cloud. We have cloud locations in US East, Central, and West. Uh, our West region just opened at the end of 2019 in Phoenix. Uh, and we have international cloud deployments on customer sites in Australia, Germany, and Canada. So if our cloud locations don't work, we can bring that cloud to you. And that applies to domestic locations as well. And we've also been a VMware cloud provider since 2007 and have 45,000 virtual machines on our platform. Uh, so we've been running VMware and cloud solutions at scale for over a decade now. But I have, I have great news, everyone. The cloud's here. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But the biggest one is that we're starting to see wider business acceptance. CIOs aren't the only people pushing it. IT isn't the only people pushing it. This is being pushed by finance people, by uh, the business units. This is being pushed by the CEO. They're going and hearing inside of their own verticals that the cloud is a way forward for them. They also are seeing that the economics just makes sense now that we're now starting to see a bigger capability and a bigger way to make better use of our funding and match our usage to our spend that actually makes a ton of sense for the business overall. And finally, there's platform capabilities that we're getting from cloud that are very difficult, if not impossible, to try to do in an on-premises environment, right? You're either going to overbuy on hardware or you're gonna try and take on services that just don't exist in an on-premises environment without spending a lot of money up front to make them work. And so when we talk to customers, when we talk about cloud, we talk about how there's more than one cloud. And the clouds that we talk about are hyperscale and enterprise cloud. Hyperscale clouds being AWS, Azure, GCP, and enterprise clouds being Expedient, VMC on AWS, and IBM cloud. These Enterprise clouds are generally VMware powered software defined data center clouds. And so when we talk about clouds, we talk about them more as a, as a vehicle than we talk about anything else, right? We're not talking about the technology that you're going to go use. We're talking about how this technology gets you to where you want to be. You want a better outcome. You want more efficiency. You want to match your spend to your usage. That's not a technology problem. That's a business problem. And so we talk about this in terms of cloud being the vehicle to make that work. And when we talk about vehicles, we talk about matching the workload to the vehicle, right? You're not going to move from one house to another in a convertible, right? Having a couch sticking out of the back of a convertible is very silly. At the same time, you're not going to live in a very tight, densely populated urban area and drive a pickup truck block to block because it's wasteful. It costs a lot of money and it doesn't really do anything for you other than be a very large vehicle. And so by matching these sorts of things to the right, matching your workload to the vehicle, you can actually get a ton of efficiency. And so we're going to talk through migrating an enterprise application to the cloud. And let's say this application is just kind of motoring on down the road, right? This van here represents an enterprise application. And these enterprise applications by and large just keep running because they are what runs the business. And the business doesn't necessarily think that it's worth the time to try and reinvest it because 
this is what they paid for and they want to use it until it literally doesn't work anymore. But what we see from enterprise applications is they have a few common characteristics. A lot of times they are utilizing hardware level redundancy. Things like if the host fails or that VM where, or that VM fails, that VM can be rebooted onto another platform, onto another host and just keep running, right? Servers are generally powered on constantly. This is commodity off the shelf software. It's not meant for scale up, scale down. It's meant to be, right? It's meant to be stood up and just go. And these applications generally existed two years ago or more, right? These are five year applications and they're, they need to be modernized, but they are also very, very hard to get rid of because they've provided so much value to the business. That's why they're still around, right? So the hypervisor is VM-based. It's usually sensitive to latency as well. If you ever try to move these applications from one data center to another and you split components of the application, you'll find out very quickly from your end users that the application's running slow or why is this being so slow today? That latency can generally be the cause of those problems. And as we start to build on-premises technology stacks around these applications, that capacity is measured in year cycles. I'm going to buy this piece of hardware for this software, and I know that I'm going to grow it 20% year over year over year. And as I build that application all the way out, I'm buying all of this hardware when really for that first year, I only need this much. And so we're over buying hardware and over buying resources that we may never end up using. And so what the business says is, well, hey, I want this, I want this cloud thing. Because I've heard a lot about the cloud and how it can eliminate a lot of those problems. And so the reason why they generally want it is the fact that they get a very fast time to market. When they need resources, they just get them. There's no big procurement process and vendor RFP, and I have to go configure and ship and cable and conf all of that process to get more resources to your applications just doesn't exist. And so by being able to do that and do it in a very fast and even automated function, I can get to the business faster. I can meet them where they are and meet up with their demands instead of being the thing that slows them down. And by doing this, I can align my costs to the business needs. So when the business needs something, they're going to be willing to pay for it because it is a thing that they actually need. And they can say, well, we needed more resources. This is the money we spent on those additional resources and line it up and feel good about their spend versus we needed more resources. We bought all of these resources we really only needed here, but we bought all this so we didn't have to go through this process twice, right? One of the big things though about cloud is that it starts to eliminate the burden of managing infrastructure. And I can take my staff that's focused on that infrastructure and I can point them to things that actually make a difference to the business instead of just the things that we do today. And I wanna be able to deploy that capital and my people to actually grow the business. And so they say, okay, we want to do this cloud operating model. But this chasm is massive. How am I supposed to get across this chasm? How am I supposed to get from one side of this to another? And well, this chasm is really the time and risk that's associated with trying to get to the cloud. So let's go through three ways that we can maybe get across this chasm. The first is app modernization and refactoring. And this is what we all talk about as the quote unquote right way to do it. And the problem with this is that this is the one that is the most fraught with peril, right? There's a reason that is a rickety bridge because there's a lot of unknowns across that bridge. You are now starting to touch your business critical applications and breaking big monolithic applications that may not want to be broken down into smaller chunks to make them more agile and more optimized for a hyperscale cloud. This takes a lot of time and it's incredibly expensive because you either have to take your people off of the stuff that they're doing today, which is going to be expensive on the other side for your existing applications, or you have to bring in consultants and contractors to come in and help you make that move, which also costs a lot of money because contractors and consultants aren't exactly cheap. And so it's also very hard to derive the value from this effort because you're not entirely sure what's, what the value is going to be until you get there. And so you have to put a ton of, in essence, hope up front that you're going to get your money's worth and you may not. And so that unknown can make it very, very, very nervous and, and anxious for the business side to want to take this sort of thing on. Along with taking on new skills 
for your staff to be able to support this. Because guess what? The moment that application moves over, you got to support it. And you don't get the opportunity to go, well, actually, we'll pay some other people to move it back. No, you've now moved it and now you have to support this. So the width of this chasm is very, very wide. So maybe, maybe there's a way we can shorten that just like a little bit. And there we get move into hyperscale lift and shift. You know what? I'm going to skip the refactoring. Not for us right now. I'm going to take my applications and I'm going to pick them up and move them directly into a hyperscale environment. I have a much more sturdy bridge. I know exactly what I'm gonna get because it's my applications here. They'll be my applications over there. And they'll live in the hyperscale cloud and we won't generally have to make any changes. They'll just work the exact same way. And yes, you get a much faster time to deployment, but you still need to pick up some new skills. How are you connecting to that? Do you understand how hyperscale cloud networking works? How are you getting from those applications that you've moved back to your end users? How do you make sure that everything is going to work the way it does today in a hyperscale environment. And so that may end up still requiring you to make staff changes or to make a bunch of investments into training to make that sort of process work. Then we enter the toll booths, right? We've got a pretty straightforward shot here, but there's a toll, right? This bridge doesn't pay for itself. And so we first hit the fit toll booth. Does this application actually fit? This is the couch in a convertible problem. Is this really a good fit for what you want to do, or is this something where maybe not doing that or holding off on that migration may actually make more sense? Because if you're looking for things that require hardware redundancy, you're not going to find it in a hyperscale cloud. If that instance, if that compute instance drops because of a hardware failure, you have to go manually turn it back on. So you have to know that that's part of that skill set ramp up for your staff. Additionally, if your things are always on, you have to pay for them all the time. Most businesses, when they buy the hardware or the resources for an application, they buy them and they say, okay, cool. We'll see you in four years when I need more resources, or I'll see you in two years when we want to grow the application, but that's it. That is the extent that they want to think about cost. In that instance, that's kind of a problem because here you have to pay monthly for that and the meter is always running. So even if you don't think you're using it, it's in use because it's powered on. And in order to get the redundancy that we're looking for, we have to buy additional instances and turn up load balancing or turn up, you know, elastic storage to be able to meet the needs of the application. And you've just added a bunch of complexity to an application that didn't need it. If your Windows operating systems are heading out there, there's a price premium for everything but Azure because Microsoft made licensing changes because they would like you to use Azure. And so if you want to use license mobility that's baked into your enterprise agreement, you can't. And so you have to pay more for the operating system licenses. So all of these things just turn into, but this, but this, but this, and it really narrows down the things that can just move as a lift and shift fit. But let's say you have that application that fits. Let's head across the bridge. Well, now there's a data transfer toll booth. And this is the one that generally gets people because traditional IT is, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret, terrible at forecasting. A lot of that has to do with the fact that you don't know where your data transfers from. You don't know where your data is going because you know that there's this application that sits in your data center and here's your big pool of end users and they connect somehow, but you don't know how much data is actually transferring back out. And so you have to map all of that to understand what your egress costs are. And that can be 15 to 25% of your hyperscale cloud bill just off the top that you may have forgotten about. And now you have to go talk to your CFO and say, hey, whoops, we didn't forecast our data, or data transfer costs at all. And now we're in trouble. So there's a number of different pieces to a hyperscale lift and shift that doesn't make sense. But I still want to get to this cloud thing. How do I do that? And there's a third option. And that is an enterprise lift and shift. Using an enterprise cloud like Expedient, number one, there's no fit toll booth. You bring your VMs over the same way they were before, because you're on a VMware platform on premises, you're landing on a VMware platform in an enterprise cloud, which means there's no refactor, there's no changes, you bring your applications over and in they work. We also don't have any egress fees because we do everything through bandwidth, which means that all you have to do is get a connection to us and off you go. We also do everything through pools of resources. So you pay for a set amount of resources every single month which removes the variability of a hyperscale cloud. You get a monthly predictable cost. And your CIO and CFO love that 
because they want the ability to say, I pay $5,000 every single month, boom, boom, boom. I know exactly what that's going to be. And I don't have to think about it, that it's going to be 5,000 this month and 10,000 next month and 2,000 next month and try to factor in the variability into our budget. We make it very, very simple. And because everything is VMware based, everything moves over smoothly along with your staff's knowledge base. They can come over and immediately start work without any sort of big learning curve to be able to meet the needs of the business. And everything is consumption based. So you're only paying for VMs that are powered on, which means you don't have to worry about all the extra hardware for redundancy or 20% year over year growth. You pay for the resources you need. And when you need more, those resources are provisioned to you without having to go through the big procurement and buy and shipping and configuration and cabling. Everything comes right in. And the biggest differentiator of all is that an enterprise cloud like Expedient has a 100% SLA. We don't play in nines, we play in ones and zeros. And that's because we've built everything to enterprise best practices. So you get the benefit of everything being built to the best specs possible. And if they're not, if something fails, you get a service credit because we wanna make sure that you are as up as you can be. But here's the thing, once you, if you think about that a little bit, you know, that's just my application, that's just my current applications. What about my next generation applications? What about cloud native? We support that as well. And so we're able to bring in containers through our Rancher platform and provide persistent storage to them via Portworks and logging and data visualization via Elastic. So you're able to get all of the cloud native capabilities from a container standpoint. All of these have REST APIs, so you can add this into your infrastructure's code. We support Terraform and Ansible. So you're able to bring these things in and make that work for your DevOps teams, for your DevOps organization where they can actually say, oh, I'm just gonna go write some code and every time we do a new spin up, I'm gonna go deploy a new VM. The infrastructure team gets all the control to build the right templates for these developers. They get all of the role-based access control and all of the logging. And then they have all of the capability to provide the API so the developers can do the things that they actually wanna go do. But here's the thing. You bring all that over to an enterprise cloud, but let's say you still want to go use a hyperscale platform, say Azure Data Lakes or Google's AI and ML things. Sure, those are really great use cases for a hyperscale cloud. We can actually enable that. So we have high speed, low latency connectivity that comes across from our cloud into the hyperscalers through point of presence at Equinix. So we have 100 gig connectivity to hyperscale clouds from some of our locations, so you can move all the data you wanna move. So you can choose the right cloud for your application. You can optimize your cloud usage so that you're using the right cloud for the right workload, the right vehicle for the right workload. And optimize that cloud spend. Let's say you have cloud credits from one of the various large hyperscalers. Instead of putting all of your things into that cloud, burning all your credits on stuff you're already running today, and then you wanna go use the cool new platform, you can just use those cool new platform with those credits and leave your existing applications and still get the same cloud operating model. Additionally, you can also save on data transfer fees. So we do everything through Direct Connect, so you actually get a lower cost than coming out directly via the internet or a VPN tunnel. So you can save money on those egress costs as well. So let's help you cross that chasm. We can help eliminate the burden of infrastructure support so your staff can focus on the things that actually matter, the things that actually make a difference. Again, that AC work. We want you to focus on the things that are gonna get you an A and get you all the kudos and let us take care of the CF work, right? We also wanna enable that cloud operating model. The business wants the cloud operating model. They want that for their applications. They want the ability to scale up and scale down and have their spend match their usage. And we can help meet that without having to jump through hoops, without having to figure out whether things fit or whether things don't fit, they fit on our platform. And additionally, we can help accelerate your digital transformation. You wanna go do a bunch of big data stuff? Cool, let us handle the basics so you can go focus on your advanced and expert level things. So that's, that's our presentation for this week. Please join us in two weeks. Uh, I know that says next week, excuse me. Uh, please join us in two weeks uh, we're going to talk about one more hardware refresh and really dig deep and talk about the dirty little secrets of where the hardware refresh costs actually come from. And if you uh, want to get your hands on an enterprise cloud, please uh, reach out to me, aj.kuftik at expedient.com, or go to vmware-test-drive 
and sign up for a 30 day free trial. You get 128 gigs of RAM and a terabyte of storage. So you can get your hands on this. You can even try out our APIs and try out our cloud native platform. So you can really see the power of an enterprise cloud. And with that, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Uh, Brian has been uh, doing a fantastic job um, going through all of the uh, questions in here. Uh, how do you estimate egress costs? Um, that's very difficult to do. And that's what makes it so challenging for a lot of our customers who want to go do hyperscale things. When we ask about what do you think your egress costs would be, we generally don't get a ton of great answers. Um, a lot of times it's, well, we'll figure it out when we're there, um, or we've budgeted a bunch of additional funds in to try and meet egress costs um, with what they're doing. But the problem is, is that that's not really a, an answer to that question, right? And this is what makes it very challenging for our customer base and for you know, most of the industry is that trying to forecast things in a place where you've never had to think about that number before can be really hard. Right, um, let me add on that as well, AJ. Does not have egress costs. So we have the ability to save you a ton of time just up front in not having to go figure those things out, but also have the ability to um, save you that money on those egress costs. So you don't have to worry about, oh, hey, somebody pulled a big pile of data out of one of our data sets now we have to pay for that data move. Everything is paid for through bandwidth. Um, yes, our, our Kubernetes offer is, uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes offering does manage Docker containers. Uh, that was a question in there. Um, you can also spin up your own Docker engine. Again, this is the flexibility of this platform. You can spin up a VM and just put Docker inside of it and run containers on top of that if you want to manage your own engine. Or you can take advantage of our managed service offering uh, that's powered by Rancher. So it's a set of Kubernetes hosts. You can put your containers on top of that. Uh, on the bottom, I believe it's container D. Um, but that allows you to build your containers on top of that platform and take advantage of things like Active Directory authentication, uh, built-in logging, uh, built-in monitoring, and all the pieces that would go around a cloud native platform that you would have to build yourself. We've, we've built it already, figured it all out, and provided as a service to you. So we also have uh, API documentation. So if you wanna take a look at that, I see there was a question about uh, scaling up and scaling down to match workflow demands. Um, you can go to apidocs.expedient.cloud and you can see our API. You can actually uh, download the collection into Postman. So if you're familiar with API management, uh, you can go pull that all into Postman, uh, download the environment variables, download uh, a set of uh, curated snippets of API calls on how to interact with our enterprise cloud so that you can start to work on your DevOps or provide that maybe back to your developers so that they can deploy their own applications to the cloud. Um, yes, the enterprise cloud is managed by Expedient 24 seven. Our operations support center is available 24 uh, seven. So they are able to answer your questions at all hours of the day, uh, but we also manage it. So if things like VMware hosts, vCenter, uh, VMware Cloud Director, vSAN, all of those things, it's all managed by Expedient. You manage your applications, we manage the infrastructure. Uh, so it gives you uh, the ability to kind of let that burden go and focus on the things that actually matter. Um, we also offer a number of managed security services, managed monitoring, uh, and managed operating systems. So we'll even get down to the point of doing your patching if you'd like us to. Um, so we can take a lot of that burden off, a lot of that day-to-day -day, you know, effort that you have to put in um, that doesn't really provide a ton of overall value to the business. It provides a ton of value to you because you're making sure that all of your applications are secure. But there is a way for you as, a, uh, as an engineer to not have to worry about that. And you can hand that off to someone else so you can focus uh, at a higher level. Yes, Brian is referencing the big fun NASA data egress uh, cost. Um, NASA migrated all of their data into uh, an S3 bucket, I believe. And then when someone asked to pull it all out, the egress cost was a very large number. Um, so 30 million a year uh, to be able to move that data in and out. So it actually provided, it, 
by moving that off, they moved the storage out, which was great, but they also added a ton of egress costs that they were not expecting. And so trying to forecast that can actually be a huge challenge. Uh, what are challenges migrating to the cloud? Um, this is really a business by business sort of question. Um, some businesses have an easier time than others. Maybe, they, maybe they're a newer business that has newer applications that don't, they don't have a ton of baggage and they can just refactor their, off their applications because they wrote them all themselves. Some businesses are maybe large organizations that have been around and using technology for 20 plus years that need to be able to pick their applications up and migrate them as is. And that's not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to do when it comes to a hyperscale cloud. So when you're really looking at this, it's really sitting down and looking at your application set and looking at what provides the most value to your business. Um, I do want to take a second here and announce the winner that is uh, Harold Upegi. I hope I got your name right, Harold. Uh, Laura will be reaching out to you. You've won a Bose SoundLink. Congratulations. Thanks for asking some questions out there. Um, I got it right. Hey, everybody. Great job. <laughs> I was very, I always get nervous. I have a, I have a name that gets mis mispronounced a lot. So I always feel bad when I mispronounce somebody else's name. So uh, thank you, Harold. Um, if there's any additional questions, uh, we can get them in. Otherwise, uh, again, you can go to expedient.com slash VMware dash test dash drive and sign up for a 30 day free trial and really take a look at what Expedient's Enterprise Cloud is doing. Uh, one of our solutions architects will actually reach out and help walk you through it. Um, so it's not just us handing you access to an environment and you, know, you try to figure out and click around. We can help get you started and help walk you through and try to figure out what your ultimate goals are on the platform. Um, so any last minute questions? Uh, other than that, I hope you guys have a great day.